right. Well, happy Friday, everybody, and welcome to another weekly update. This one is for Friday, February 23rd. And I tell you, I was saying this to somebody this week. <laughs> I do these every week, and literally, I get done recording for the Friday update, and I go, oh, something else has changed that I want to include in there. Uh, so it's always fun, and also uh, some of this week's came from some of the folks that are listening and watching. So thank you also to those of you who either engage with me on this in our live conversations, if we catch virtual coffee or something like that, or through your messages or emails that I get through LinkedIn or emails. So thank you again. It's always fun when it's a bit of a community experience. And this was a new experiment I added at the end of last year, just because I was getting so many uh, questions on, you know, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? Which it's actually funny. That's actually how my podcast started in the first place was I got a lot of questions specific to corporate tech and workplace ecosystems. And so then I started a podcast about it because I thought, well, this will help. And now that podcast is expanded and then it expanded further at the end of the year with this weekly update. So this week, I'm probably going to move a little faster than usual. Well, so before I do, let me just say, please keep the things coming. I love hearing from all of you and one hearing, you know, whether it's helpful or not, but then also just engaging with you on, you know, hey, what are you seeing? What are you encountering that grabs your attention that you're just curious about another take? So keep sending those along. Thanks for the support and encouragement along the way. So this week I've got five. One, I'm guessing most people will not be surprised by at all, but the other ones, we'll see what happens. Um, so the first one, we'll start a little dark and heavy on here. I'll, I'll be honest, this one's a little bit of a dark and heavy one that, I don't know, I think there's a lot of this out there and I thought, hey, you know what, it's worth, it's worth at least talking about a bit. So if you, in any way, shape or form, have ever heard of Eliezer Yudkowsky, he's notoriously pessimistic about the future of where things are going with AI and, and all of that. And I listen to lots of different folks from all different perspectives. I tend to find myself taking alignment with some of the grim ends of it, but then some of them I'm like, nah, you know, whatever. And so it's interesting where I land and how I react to these, but somebody actually sent this to me and they were like, what do you think? Because historically Eliezer Yudkowsky has He's been pretty open for a while that he thought it would be the end of humanity within 50 years. That was kind of the number he was shooting at uh, before. And he recently came out, you can look it up, it's an article on futurism. He recently came out and he said, I, my, I'm adjusting my timeline. I think it's going to be more like five, maybe 10, maybe even as few as two. Um, so again, I think this is largely a reaction coming from how quickly things are advancing. And I will be the first to say I too even get overwhelmed, which you'll hear from some of the things I'm talking about this week. There are definitely some things that are moving at a pace that go, well, whatever change is coming. I, I, what I agree with on his extreme point is I do think some of the massive scale changes that many have kind of said, yeah, that'll come, but it's not going to come for decades. We probably won't see this for a while. Even I'm on record, I was listening back to something the other day. I'm on record and I agree with this, that I think we are going to see massive, massive change within five years. I mean, as in the world will be radically different than we know it today. That's my prediction. So I don't think he's wrong that things will be radically different as soon as five, 10, even two years. That I think him updating his timeline, I think he's spot on. End of humanity to me feels a little bit extreme. My position on that would be, could technology end humanity? I'm, I'm thinking about this on the fly. Could where technology is going and the pace at which it's moving, would it have the potential to end humanity in as few as two years, maybe five to 10? I think it could. But be careful if you, you know, are reacting to that or you quote me on that, because what I would say to that is there has been technological advancements that I would say could have ended humanity in a matter of years when it was coming out. So again, fusion, nuclear fusion and the nuclear bomb, quite frankly, I think that had the potential to end humanity in as few as two to five years, depending on some of the decisions and how things went. Now, if you know my worldview, you know I'm coming from a Christian worldview. So for me, it's like, well, nothing's going to happen until it's allowed to happen. But do I think there's probably more risk that, yeah, we're going to see some pretty crazy, wild, dangerous things in 
a lot less time than the average person is thinking. I would very much agree with that. Do I think we need to be like building a hole in our ground and say so long, you know, in less than 10 years, we're all going to be gone. That I think is a little bit doomsday and, and probably more rhetoric to try and stir things up. But I actually do think he believes what he's saying. And I think he has some good reasons to believe that. Again, there's a lot of people that I encounter and engage with who just have a different worldview. And if I had a different worldview, I would probably be more on that end of like, ooh, you know, this is the end because what other options do we have? So that's where I am with that. But I, I thought that was funny when somebody shared that. They're like, what do you think? The person that sent it, they're like, what do you think? You think we got more than two years? And I do, I, but to anybody who listens or watches this and goes, oh, you know, this stuff's not going to change that. We're just going to slowly adapt and it'll be fine. I would say with even some of the things I'm going to share today, you might be like, oh, snap. Um, so let's talk about one of those, which is, if you didn't hear, this was just released. So Neuralink, Elon Musk and all this, they had a big press release, big announcement that their Neuralink implant has been successful. So for those of you who followed any of my other stuff or have been kind of following what's been going on with that, Neuralink has implanted a chip in people's brains. If you listen to the one where I first talked about it, they aren't the only player in the game, but obviously they're one of the most prominent in terms of notoriety and they're pushing boundaries. That was one of the things I cautioned before was they're kind of throwing caution to the wind when it comes to risk. But anyway, all that to say, I did announce when I was on here saying like, Hey, they successfully implanted the chip. It was a success. Well, now there's been another update in this implanted chip in that Again, I haven't taken a ton of time to dig into this and all these things. A lot of times it's like, well, how successful was it really? You know, we have to, I don't always like to react to things as soon as they hit the headlines because usually there's more to the story. That said, you're probably all like, shut up, Christopher. What did it say? Well, what it said was this, some of their patients now are successfully controlling the mouse cursor with their brain, with their mind, with their thoughts. They're simply thinking and moving the cursor on their computer around, which depending on where you land on this, that may freak you the heck out. That may make you wildly excited. That may make you sitting in disbelief. I don't know, or somewhere in between. I personally, going back to my first point, things are moving so much faster than I think anyone anybody I know who's even been in this space for a long, long, long time has said, this is moving faster than I can even keep up with. And I will say, yeah, I think when we heard like, Hey, chip in the brain, like that's, I think people were thinking like, yeah, it'll be years. And then all of a sudden it was like, Oh, or it's 2024. And then it was like, well, it'll be a while before it really does anything. And then already we're in February and it's like, Hey, we're controlling a computer screen. This stuff is moving really, really, really quick. And this is one where I'm curious to see what's next. Now, personally, I have mixed feelings on this because in some ways, I think it could be an incredible and beautiful innovation. I think about people with disabilities who you know, may not be able to speak or see or hear or whatever, and being able to implant a chip that now can overcome those things maybe paralysis. And I mean, again, you, th you start thinking about the healthcare implications of this. There's a lot of really cool potential, maybe, but for me where I still kind of struggle with where is that line on transhumanism and how far will we go with it with, okay, well, like then what do we hook AI up to this? Do we make people internet connected? And you just know with the pace things are moving, we're just going to keep moving it forward. And especially with it being in, you know, Musk's hands and him at the throne, you know, it's going to just be pushed. And I, what I'm not seeing is, Hey, let's take the time to see what are some of the potential implications or what are the things that we're not thinking about? But I don't know. I will keep folks updated. I'll keep you updated as I keep following this. Cause I'm really interested to see where it goes. Again, I think I still am shocked by some of the ads kind of advertising for people to sign up for this thing. And sometimes I just go, what are we doing here? But at the same time, there's also a part of me that goes, yeah, you know what? I've got lots of friends and I grew up with a sister with disabilities. Uh, and so I have mixed feelings. I have mixed feelings, but that's where we are. So the idea that you could control a computer with your brain, with your mind, 
it's no longer science fiction, folks. Uh, so more to come on that one. All right. Now let's talk. <laughs> if you haven't heard about Air Canada and the chatbot debacle, watch out. This was a risk last year. I was cautioning people as they were getting so excited about chatbot, chatbot integration. Oh, look what we can do with large language models and generative AI. It can be a human being and you know all the all the benefits of having a person, none of the risks. Dun, dun, dun. Like big reveal, here come the risks. I told, I hate to say I told you so, but Air Canada, I told you so. So to give you some context for this, a customer had, I can't remember the exact specifics of it. So again, feel free, you know, fact check me on this by all means. But essentially a passenger, I believe, traveled first and then it was for bereavement purposes. And so they were interacting with a chat bot. And anyway, the chat bot stated the policy wrong and essentially said they were eligible for a refund or some credit back to this whole thing. And it wasn't correct wasn't accurate. And guess what? To me, this was less about like, you might read the article and go, why would you make such a big deal over? I think it was like $820. Why would Air Canada care about $820? So if you're looking at that and going, this does seem like a little bit of an odd thing to get so up in arms about. Here's the thing about it. And this is the part that not, I don't think enough people are talking about is what Air Canada did in response to this was, they tried to divorce themselves from their chatbot and basically throw AI under the bus and say, hey, that wasn't us. That was artificial intelligence. It hallucinated, it malfunctioned. Therefore, we should not be accountable for what AI did. Not says the court of law, and I, I knew this was where things were gonna go, is the courts say, I'm sorry, AI cannot be individually held accountable for its mistakes. You, Air Canada, are accountable for its mistakes. <laughs> and so Air, the, the courts decided, Air Canada, it was your chatbot. You implemented it. You decided to put it in charge of what it's in charge of. You gave it authority to speak on these things. Like You made the decision points. You are liable for what your chatbot did, which... In some ways, I'm like, thank goodness they did, because I think had the courts ruled the other way, this would be opening us up to a whole nother realm of problems. And then maybe Eliezer wouldn't be so wrong, because then all of a sudden you go, well, AI can do whatever it wants, and it's not really our fault. And that may seem like a subtle thing, but even think as an individual, if you start to believe that what AI does isn't really your fault, even if you're the one telling it what to do or giving it the guidelines to do it. Think how much more likely you're going to be to allow AI to do things you probably shouldn't let it do and give it access to things you probably don't want it having access to, allowing it to make decisions you shouldn't be letting it make decisions. If you truly can just go, oh, that was AI, not me, and wash your hands and walk away. So in some ways, this gave me hope that, you know, Eliezer, I think you're wrong. It's not going to be two years in the end of humanity because of the fact that we still, as a society, say people are accountable for what is done with this technology. We cannot simply wash our hands of it and say, oh, well, no big deal. But here's the caution, folks, because I know there are a lot of business leaders. I know there's a lot of tech founders out there creating AI products designed to deliver answers, not just chatbots, but I'm seeing some of these big, large language model things like for HR departments where it's like, hey, it'll write your HR policy for you. Careful, it's not gonna be the AI or the platform you're gonna be able to point the finger at when it goes wrong or business leaders who are going, you know what, maybe we just replace all our customer service reps with AI because We'll get the same level of service. And hey, if something goes wrong, we just blame the AI. Wrong, you're going to be accountable for that. And there isn't going to be the clear accountability structure and ways to deal with it, even within the legal system, that there are if it's a person. If somebody, if a person 
does something and colors way outside the lines of what your policy and things are. So long as you're a company, and this is as a learning leader and have been in HR, I see this all the time where it's like, there are legally defensible ways that companies can set themselves up to say, hey, this person was explicitly instructed not to do these things. These are not what our policies say. So them doing this, that is divorced from us. And there's still ways to do that. With AI, clearly based on this ruling, you can't just go, well, I mean, our policy is this, and I don't know. It, they're going to say, well, it doesn't really matter. And so I would just caution if you're a tech company looking at starting up a product and saying, hey, great, we're going to tell people what they should do with our product or give them answers. Be careful because what could happen, and I, this isn't there yet, but Air Canada, and I wouldn't be surprised, they might not over this, but they may, if we see bigger things like this happen, this will happen. Air Canada could go back to its AI provider, whoever that company was, because I'll just tell you, that's not a new thing to throw your vendor under the bus and say, oh, well, like now I'm on the hook. Well, you know what? I'll just you know, throw my vendor under the bus. And so again, the chain will just go right back. And that's a real risk. So again, if you're a tech founder, remember this risk could boil up and kick you in the teeth. But then if you're a business, this could kick you in the teeth. So just, again, I was encouraged with where it landed, but it's far more complicated than just, yay, the courts ruled in favor of human accountability. There's still more to come with this, but just as a cautionary tale to this, and again, if you read it and go 820 bucks, you've got to think about the deeper, impl deeper implications of this because that's really what is at stake here. All right, next. <laughs> this is the one that I don't think will, I got, I don't know how many messages about this. I, I had seen it and then the flood of messages came in. If you have not heard about OpenAI's Sora, it is their new text to video capability. Now, for the record, people are acting like this is a brand new thing and it's never been done before. I actually have know a couple founders who are have been doing text to video with AI for a bit. So this isn't necessarily radically new, but the reason it is taking the world by storm right now is first of all, one, their way of doing it is pretty incredible. I mean, some of the AI text to video products I've seen is you, know, you can kind of tell it what you're trying to do and it'll pull some stock stuff together and create kind of a meaning visual storyboard for whatever text is going on. This is completely different in that if you look at what a a OpenAI Sora does, you basically say, I want a video of this, 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 and this, and it will create, go Google OpenAI Sora examples, and you will see some of these videos, right now it's capped at 60 seconds, but some of these videos are phenomenal. I mean, undetectable to the human eye that they are completely fabricated. They're completely artificial. And you would look at it and think, no, that's got to be real. There's no way that that's just completely made up. Um, and again, it's not pulling from stock stuff and putting it to, it's literally generating a completely new video off of your prompts. And if you look at some of the examples, if you look at some of the different stuff, you're it can do. It's extremely powerful. Now, the processing power behind this, I can see why OpenAI. Last week, I said they're get, looking to get into the chip business at the cool low price of seven trillion dollars. But I can see why, and I think there's going to be a big race to this. Now, good news, just so you know, here's some good news in this. <laughs> if you're like, how do I get my hands on it? You don't, unless you are someone who either knows someone who knows someone, or there's a limited group of folks who are have access to it for testing purposes to see what this is. Um, it's not, I don't think the mainstream is ready for this capability. And again, if you've listened to my stuff at all, you know of some of the concerns I have about deep fakes and what that can do and the risks associated with that. This to me takes that to another level if we were to release this to the masses. And I know some people go, oh, well, it's got guardrails on it. If you've ever tried to jailbreak a large language. It's not hard. It's not hard to do if you know your way around something. So to even use a supposedly safe model, you could easily start to create artificial, realistic media that 
I mean, you can see examples of what people have done with this and you can very quickly start to put the pieces together and go, holy cow. And this goes back to something I've been saying for a while. We are moving into the age of distrust where people are going to struggle to know what is real anymore? Like, how do I know what is real? Because if you think of that video capability, your ability to generate a totally fake video of something, you can create a totally fake voice of something. You put that all together. I mean, again, it's not hard to imagine. I mean, I can see why some of the big names in the space are going, we got two years left type of a thing. Again, I don't adhere to that, but I do think things like this are going to create some real difficulty for us. I think if anything, as people listening or watching, I think discernment and wisdom and taking time to seek to understand before we react to things is going to be especially paramount as we move into this age of artificial information, because it's going to be so easy to just create fake things and people have a lot of motives to do it. I mean, I'm in the U S going into election season. I can only imagine the use cases people are drumming up with something like this and going, Hey, you know, we can make you know all this stuff happen. So again, but again, this goes back to my very first point, the pace at which things is moving. It is insane. I literally recorded last week's weekly update going, all right, I think I've captured the majority of some of the biggest advancements in the tech space. Right. And then boom, I finished recording. I'm like, Nope, I just missed Probably one of the biggest ones. I even debated going back and re-recording the whole thing, but I, I don't got that kind of time. So anyway, but this goes back to things are moving extremely fast. And I think it's important that you're aware of this because this is the kind of stuff that even a video clip, a viral video clip, you see something, you need to be asking, is this real? And do a little bit of fact checking, do a little bit of work, try and understand, get to know, spend time getting to know people. Um, assume the best before you assume the worst. I can tell you right now, the misinformation that's not going to be created, that's going to be created with this kind of stuff. It's not going to be created for people's benefit. It's not going to be like, man, wouldn't it be great if we created fake information to inspire and motivate people to treat each other with kindness and love? Like that's not how people are going to use it. I mean, some might, but that's not the majority. So again, be patient, be kind, be loving to people around you because you just don't know. Um, and yeah, so anyway, that was a big announcement. I'm interested to see how quickly they take that mainstream. I'm also interested to see what happens. I'll talk a little more about it maybe next week or something like that. I've been following some of the developers over at AI, open AI and GPT five is on the horizon and whether we're, whether we're ready for that or not is a question that is probably worth me discussing on here. All right. Last but not least, so that I can keep this to a reasonable time, is this is less of a headline I came across and more of a cautionary tale that I would have for either remote or hybrid employees based on a lot of the things that we're seeing right now. And this is just, again, me kind of seeing what's happening in the world and looking to the future a little bit. Right now, if you look at the environment and this big push to get people back into the office, there is this growing rise in tension between people who are for, you know, in the office and those who are against. We've still got a lot of remote workers as a result of the pandemic. We have people who want to have more flexibility in their job. It is still the number one thing that people prioritize, which if you're at a company that thinks that employees who show up five days a week and sit at their desk all the time are better employees. I just want to kind of extend a warning out there to remote employees or people who maybe don't have super strong relationships, even if you are in the office. The growing rise I'm seeing in proximity bias in conjunction with the rise of deep fake technology and the advancements in artificial intelligence that is going to start making people just one, question everything and maybe only trust what they can tangibly touch in the same room type of a thing. I just have a sneaking suspicion we're going to start to see companies continue to move towards this like, well, if we can't see them, how do we know they're real? How do we know they're actually doing their job? How do we, isn't it possible that we could just eliminate them with AI? And I don't think, I mean, I'm a remote employee. So for me, this is a watch out for myself as much as it is to anybody watching and listening. First of all, my call to leaders who may be 
in a position where they are struggling against this. And maybe this is your tendencies to be like, well, if they're not here and I can't see them, how do I know they're doing anything? Don't let that get you. Don't buy into that because quite frankly, having worked in an office, because I haven't always been remote, I can tell you right now, the people you can touch and see, just because you can touch and see them does not mean they're any more real than the people you can't. Uh, and so just be careful that your bias doesn't blind you to the real value that there is in your employees. But I think the caution to the folks who are hybrid or who are remote, I think more than ever, it's going to be important to be relentlessly intentional about building strong relationships and finding ways to be present digitally and going out of your way to go to those efforts. Because as AI and this whole stuff starts to rise and people start questioning what is real, the natural tendency is going to be for people to go back to what they're comfortable with, which is, well, I can't possibly be fooled by this. So I'm just going to gravitate towards my bias in that. And as a result, when you gravitate towards something, you gravitate away from something else. And this is just something that as I've been watching some of the headlines around big CEOs and some of the steps are taking, I can't, who was it? UPS is CEO and some of the stuff he was talking about with his in office. I mean, there's, there's a number of companies that are just taking some crazy hard stances on this. And I think it's potentially going to get worse. And I think that doesn't mean you should just throw your hands up and go, so what you're saying is screw flexibility. We're just going to have to succumb to this. I don't think that's the response, but I do think you are going to have to accept that as an inevitability and recognize you're going to have to work that much harder to overcome it. And so with that, that would be the guidance and encouragement I would give out to folks uh, before you get to that point. Because there's nothing worse than getting there and going, shoot, now it happened. Christopher was right. Now what do I do with it? Um, much better if you can say, okay, now I have the runway to put those things in motion, to do these things, to make these changes, to prepare for this kind of stuff. So if it ever gets to that, and I hope I'm wrong. Honestly, I hope I'm wrong. But based on what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing, I don't think I will be. So there's my end on maybe a, a heavier note uh, than usual, but hopefully there's some encouragement in that, that you can overcome it. You just need to be intentional and you have to accept it's a reality. So with that, I hope you have a great week. Check out the bonus content. I dropped an additional live stream this week uh, based on a global sentiment survey that went out and kind of reacted to some of that. So check that out. Keep sending your stuff along. I love hearing from you all. And I hope you have a great week. We will see you on the other side.